the Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions. Eagles fans everywhere, this is for you. Let the celebration begin. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Eagle Eye Podcast with Ruben Frank. I'm Dave Zangaro. Ruben, it sounds like Jalen Hurts is the guy. Yeah, kind of an interesting morning. Uh, out of the blue, Chris Mortensen from ESPN reports that Jeff Lurie has made the call and has instructed the front office, uh, don't go get a quarterback. We, we already got one. Yeah, certainly interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about Jalen Hurts and, and this decision from on high. And we'll also talk about Jeff Lurie's involvement uh, in personnel decisions and football decisions. Uh, we also want to talk about some potential trades. Uh, Zach Ertz and another veteran uh, reportedly involved in some trade discussions. And then we want to get into a recent mock draft scenario and kind of give our takes on whether we think it would make sense or not. But yeah, the big news is Jalen Hurts. And it's interesting because I think this is the right decision. I think I've we've both said, I think for a while that, hey, let's see what this kid can do. You already, you drafted him and it was a move that basically ended your relationship with your former franchise quarterback. You at least deserve to find out if this kid can be the guy. But that that also doesn't mean that I'm cool with Jeff Laurie making these decisions. You know, I, there's not really a way to stop him from making these decisions or being heavily involved. He owns the team, but uh, that was my takeaway from this. Yeah, um, I, th- I think I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I don't think it's a, as egregious as I think, you know, I, th- I think as an owner, you know, any team, the biggest decision you have is who's the quarterback. And I, I think most owners are involved in that kind of decision. I think the difference is they don't announce it and they don't, it, it's not. I mean, I think every owner in the league is intimately involved with that question. Who's going to be your quarterback leading this franchise? Uh into the future. Um, and I think these kind of edicts or recommendations or advisories come down all the time from, from owners um, w- with very few exceptions. I mean, there are some complete, you know, absentee owners um, who, who don't get involved in these things, but there's not many. And um, something like, you know, now if Jeff Lurie starts, you know, talking about, what linebacker to, to draft in the fifth round or whatever it is, then, then you have a problem. But for, for Jeff Lurie to have a voice in the most important decision uh, that kind of involves any franchise, it's not that uncommon. And uh, it doesn't mean he's Jerry Jones. It doesn't mean he's meddling. It, it means uh, I, I, now ideally you would, you would like him to trust Howie Roseman to make that call. Um, but would you? Um, and that raises a whole other series of questions. Yeah, it does. <laughs> if he doesn't trust Howie Roseman to make that call, why is Howie, Howie Roseman still the general manager? It's a fair question. Uh, but um, I think it's the right call. And um, it's really unusual for something like this to come out attributed to Jeff Lurie. Um, you know, it, it would be unethical for us to speculate about who Chris Morton's sources are. Um, but in most cases with these kind of things, you can kind of figure it out um, on your own. And obviously this is something that came from pretty high up in the organization. And, um, you know, one question is, does this handicap the Eagles on draft day at all? I don't think it does because I think all the teams in the top 10 or the top 12 kind of know what each other is doing anyway. And that's how trades get made. Mm -hmm. Um, There's not a lot of secrets. Everybody knows for the most part, um, you know, what, what's going on. Um, so I don't think it's that that's an issue, uh, but it's really high, highly unusual for something like this to come out uh, a month and a half before the draft, um, you know, according to, you know, tr- attributed to a source. It's, it's a strange situation. Um, why would the Eagles want that out there? I'm not really sure unless they, um, they want to get Jalen as comfortable as possible, as confident as possible, feeling as, you know, ownership of that position as early as possible. But you can also just tell the guy, um, you know, that we're not taking a quarterback. You're our guy moving forward. Um, really interesting. Um, really interesting the way it all it all went down. And, and again, Chris Mortensen um, mentioned this at first. I think it was on Sports Center this morning. 
um, Monday morning and then, and then tweeted about it. Um, so certainly interesting, unusual, irregular, but ultimately I think the right decision. Yeah, it is. But I, I do want to say that I, I, while I, I like the idea of giving Jalen Hurts a year, I also think that they, it, it made sense to look at these quarterbacks too. You know, because if they're not really sold on Hertz and they go through their process and they figure out, hey, I, I we really like whoever, pick a guy. You know, that, that part of this isn't as important right now as um, the philosophy behind it. But if, if they look at one of these guys and they think that's our guy, we think he's a real franchise quarterback and we're not sure about Jalen Hurts, then, then it made sense to me. And, and while that's probably not – what I would do, I think they owe it to themselves to go through that process, and it doesn't sound like they're going to. Yeah, um, unless this is a smokescreen, which is certainly possible. Um, these things have happened before. I mean, um, you know, Buddy Ryan called Keith Byers a medical reject a week before drafting him in the first round. Um, so, you know, these things do happen, but it doesn't seem like that's the case. And you're right. Um, I, I think they'll still do their due diligence with, with the quarterbacks and look at them. Maybe they've already decided none of these guys, you know, they, they don't, they don't consider any of these guys that high that they would, you know, trust the franchise with them. Um, that that's certainly possible um, from what I've heard next year's quarterback crop isn't, as good as this year. So you put yourself in a position where if Hertz um, doesn't play up to the level that you would want your potential franchise quarterback to play at, and you want to draft a guy next year, a, maybe you don't get, you know, maybe you might be, you know, you might be picking at number 14 or 12 or 16 and not have a chance to get that guy. You don't pick at number six very often. And that's where, you know, you got a lot of your best quarterbacks. So that's a risk. Um, and, you know, you could win the division with Jalen Hurts at seven and nine and not pick in the, in the top half of the first round at all. So um, it, it, there's no perfect scenario. Um, any quarterback, even if you draft um, Trevor Lawrence, there, it's not, a, you know, there's no locks. There's no guarantees. Um, so it's a risk however you do it. Um, I think this is probably the best. You know, I think if you do draft a Jamar Chase or a, um, you know, uh, Devontae Smith, Kyle Pitts, any of these guys, if, if Hurts doesn't work out and you're in a position where, you know, and they'll also be in a position where they could, I think, next year have the money to sign a, a top free agent quarterback. There's usually not that many of them. After all the movement this year, I don't know how much they'll be next year with quarterbacks, but that's also in play. Trade for a guy, not ideal. Um, but you'll still have that weapon that you draft this year. So whoever the quarterback is, you're going to have I mean, Kyle Pitts is 20, you know, so well, whoever the quarterback is in 2022 is going to have an elite guy. If that's the, the, the direction you go, uh, but there's, there's no guarantees uh, of any of these guys. And, and that's what makes it fun. Yeah. I think the scariest thing with Hertz is kind of the same situation you're in now. If, what if he plays okay next year, you know, like what if he's okay the offense is fine. They're eight and eight. You know, like that's to me the scariest situation to be in. And one, you'd almost root for him to be great or awful. Yeah. I think if he's good and they're eight and eight, you feel like with another year, uh, I mean, maybe, but if he's not, then you've now put three years into it. It's true. It's true. And that's why there's, there's no, there's no guarantees, but you know, guys do sometimes get better gradually. I mean, we, and he I, might, I wrote a whole piece a couple of weeks ago about how, you know, some, some time, and it's not like this as much anymore as it used to be, but um, you know, there's quarterbacks who don't get really good until their third, fourth, fifth year. And so I think if you see progress each year, you know, you, you feel like, you know, you, you might have something there, but yeah, it's um, sometimes teams don't even wait more than a year. And so it's the, the clock ticks a lot faster these days than it used to when, well, he's only going into his fourth year. So, you know, he's, he's still got some upside. You know, I mean, 
I, you know, Randall Cunningham wasn't a full-time starting quarterback until his fifth year, his fourth year. You know, so uh, and that was a long time ago. I think things have changed, but guys are allowed to get better gradually. We'll see if uh, if he gets a chance. It's it's going to be interesting. I think he's going to be pretty good. I, I have I no idea. I don't know what his ceiling is, but um, I think it'll. I, I think he'll be all right. I think he'll play well. I I'm leaning that way, but I I really don't know. And the problem is they don't know either. You know, the fact that we even heard that they were open to looking at other possibilities kind of falls in line with that, right? Like if if they really thought he was good enough, if they really thought no question about it, he's our guy, we would have heard this a month ago. It's true. It's true. And that's a little alarming that it was the owner that decided this, not the people whose job is to evaluate talent. But then again, the and it doesn't who- mean they wouldn't have come to this conclusion. Right. Right. But I do want to get your take on that because you mentioned that, that obviously the owner is going to be a part of a decision of this magnitude. It's the biggest after, you know, we talked about the Carson thing for so long. And now that that's out of the way, this is clearly the most pressing decision the organization has to make. Yeah. The, the owner is of course going to be involved. I wonder a little bit about that involvement though. Like if, and, and there are, are multiple reasons to be a little concerned about Jeff Lurie's involvement over the last few years. Right. Fair. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny. I I think I, I forget where I was. I did a radio appearance and they were asking about Jeff Lurie. And I said, well, the reason I haven't brought him up is because unless someone has $3 billion, like like, you talk about the GM, you talk about the coach, you talk about the quarterback because there's change that can happen there the only way to force an owner to, to, to change is to stop supporting the team. And that's not going to happen or, or he tr- sells the team and that's not going to happen either. So um, it, it's always a scary thing when you start talking about an owner meddling and I, I, you're right. I don't know if this rises to the, that level of meddling because it is such an important decision, but I think Jeff Lurie is much more involved in a lot of the high level football decisions than people realize. And I think uh, over the last few years, we've just learned about it more. Yeah. And that was kind of the knock on him early in his ownership. And um, I think it was worse then, um, but um, it's there. It, it is there uh, and it's not going to change. Um, I think if, and, and, you know, he sees himself, I mean, he studied this game now for 25 years and he sees himself as, really knowledgeable. I mean, you've heard him talk about players. I mean, he goes into great detail, um, but it's, it's not his, it's not his strength. I mean, it just isn't his strength is being really rich. (laughs) That's what he brings to the table. Strength to have. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I, you know, I think he cares and I think he works hard at it, but it's just not, it's not who he is and what he does. Um, But I keep coming back to, you know, if you have Ozzie Newsom as your, as your general manager, you know, Steve Bashotti's not telling him what quarterback to take, you know? And I'm guessing that, you know, once Andy Reid got really established here, he was probably able to tell Jeff, like, Jeff, I got this. To an extent, probably. Yeah. yeah. But I think there was still a little bit, a little bit of that there. Um, I think it's always been there, uh, but I, I think you're right. I think it's kind of come to the forefront now more um, but it's, it's, you know, I think it kind of puts the focus on Howie's failures as a GM. If Howie didn't have those failures, I don't think, I don't think Jeff would be involved to the extent he is maybe with the quarterback, he would be, but if you have a general manager, who's, you know, who you trust implicitly to make these decisions, you're going to let him make these decisions. And if you don't, why don't you get another general manager? That's what I don't get. Well, I've got a bunch in the building. He does. It's a GM factory. Um, I will say, though, that Jeffrey was heavily involved in the Carson Wentz pick. Yeah, absolutely. In 16. And, and that's another franchise altering decision. So um, it's not exactly shocking that he'd be involved in this decision either. He loved Sudfeld, too, coming out. That hasn't changed. <laughs> that still hasn't changed. Um yeah, no, he was. He, he 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 was. I mean, it's not like he's wrong every time. Uh, that's that's really not the point, though. Um, 
You know, there's, there's, it, it comes down to the way these decisions are made is not ideal. It's not ideal. And it doesn't mean they're not all wrong, but the way they're made isn't, isn't ideal. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a, uh, long-term, I, I really wonder if it's a tenable working, you know, workflow. Um, I still think they probably need another GM to, to have sustained success with young players. Um, maybe he'll prove me wrong. Maybe though he'll go on a run um, drafting great young players, but um, I'll, believe, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly going to have the opportunity to do so with not just a lot of picks, but high picks. I mean, yeah. We're talking premium picks here. So if he can't get it done with the picks he's about to have this year and next year, he's not going to be able to get it done. Yeah. And I mean, we'll, you know, we'll talk about some of the trades that they're, you know, considering now. And I mean, these trades are just going to bring him picks and, you know, how he looks at it like, like mathematically, he's like, if you hit on 40% of your picks and you have 20 picks, um, you know, you're going to hit on uh, eight of them. If you have 10 picks, you're going to hit on four of them. So Let's get more picks. And I mean, that kind of makes sense. Um, I, you know, if you have 30 picks, you hit on 20, you know, 40% of them, now you're going to hit on 12 guys. So um, that that's how he's approached. Let's get more picks. Maybe we'll hit on more guys. And, and there's it, truth. It makes there. sense. There yeah. absolutely is truth to that. And and this team was in a position for but a few the years is, there. If you have 10, 10 picks and you hit on 60% of them, you know, or 15 picks and you hit on 60% of them, that's better because then you don't have to trade guys that you might not want to trade. That's true. Uh, but, uh, you know, this organization was in a position for a couple of years there where they were drafting five players in a draft and it, it's hard. I mean, even the Goddard year, it ended up being a good draft right. 2018, but they had what five picks and they traded out of the first round to be able to do that. You know, so your first picks in the second round, you have, I mean, that's that's a tough deal. And look, they were coming off the Super Bowl. No one really cared, but it's tough to do that. That was actually – and then the funny thing is that ended up being one of his better drafts in recent history. Right. You're right. Um, if you're if you're Howie Roseman and, you know, Jeff Lurie has instructed you not to draft a quarterback and, and then ESPN is reporting that Jeff Lurie has basically instructed you not to draft a quarterback, how does it make, does it make Howie feel today? Let's go through Howie's mind. You think he's not going to draft a quarterback, <laughs> but like, it's not a great look, you know, uh, it's not, but I wonder if he views it the same way as you do that. Like, yeah, of course the owner has a say in the quarterback position because he went through this in, in 2016. I think they actually did agree on Carson. So that helped, but um, he went through it before. It's not like Jeffrey being involved was anything new to him. It doesn't look good for him. I, I agree publicly. Like it seems like the owner is kind of undercutting him, but we also don't know if this isn't the what how he would have come up with anyway. He did draft Jalen Hurts. Sure. Yeah. That, and that's not even in a way. That's not even the point. But yeah. Um, why would Jeff Lurie want this out there, or why would the Eagles, whoever you know, why why would the Eagles want this out there? Yeah. I mean, it, it's fair to say that not every report has an ulterior motive. I mean, sometimes it's just a good reporter getting information. Um, But I, you know, if you're looking for a reason, it could be to say that six pick is for sale possibly, you know, if there's a team who wants a quarterback and that quarterback is there at six, we're open for business. We don't need to take that quarterback. I mean, that's a possibility. It's, I mean, you can also look at it as you mentioned, you can tell Jalen hurts, but that perception helps Jalen Hurts too. Like he's the guy. And it, it, I think it means more that the rest of the world knows he's the guy as opposed to just him knowing. That's probably true. It's good for his teammates to hear it. And, and even guys who might be coming here, you know, um, to hear it, young, young weapons type guys. So uh, I, I guess it's just so weird. It's just such a, it's a weird, a weird day. It's a weird day. Hey, Eagles fans, it's time to look forward to a dream vacation. The Philadelphia Eagles fan cruise tickets are selling out quickly. The ship sails in a year, March of 2022. And it's uh, seven days, seven glorious nights with Eagles fans and only Eagles fans. 
Book your tickets today at PhiladelphiaEaglesCruise.com. Does that read say glorious or just add the word glorious? No, I threw that in there because I'm just thinking, you know, the, the open ocean and the blue sky. and Sounds you know, great. Yeah. I, yeah, I think glorious is appropriate. Yeah, that's a good word. Uh, interesting trade discussions involving the Eagles. One of them not so surprising, Zach Ertz, uh, NFL Network's Mike Silver reported a trade could be happening in the in the coming days. Not much of a surprise there. The Eagles have been trying to trade Zach Ertz for a while now. I mean, they probably would have traded him during last season if he hadn't gotten hurt. It's going to happen or they're going to cut him, right? Sounds more, at least from the report, that it's going to happen. I mean, he made it sound like there's, you know, a number of – suitors and uh which tells you maybe the price will be a little you know a little better than we had anticipated some of that could have been posturing as well and just trying to drum up the market a little bit yeah exactly so it's hard it's hard to tell you know sometimes you have this report you know all these teams are interested in the guy and a week later the guy gets cut you know so um and we've talked about this do you they're not going to trade him to a team he doesn't really want to go to i don't think just for a fifth round pick you know if i think if it's a third round pick then yeah but um if uh if they if they cut him then that tells you um they just couldn't get a deal that he was okay with that made sense for them i think he's earned that um so yeah i don't know if a team would trade for him if he doesn't want to be there right and that that's part of it too so um and i i think he'll i think he's going to be okay i think he'll play well in the right place i think it was just a bad year I mean, the guy's a year removed from 88 catches in a season. So I don't think he's done. Takes good care of himself. Um, it was just a bad year for everybody. You know, it was just a bad year for the whole franchise. Yeah. So I think the if thing he goes- with him is like he never had elite athletic traits, you know? So it's not like if there's, we're not going to see a huge drop off there. He's always, the, his strength has always been body control. And you don't lose that. Yeah. So I, yeah, I think you're probably right. If he goes to the right spot, he can still be effective. He can get open, and he'll he'll get. So if he's open and the quarterback can get him the ball, um, he'll he'll play well. Um, so yeah, so we'll see. I think that you know, and again, these you know, these. Uh, I mean, it seems like every player on the roster, thirty and older, has either restructured or been cut or traded or the the subject of trade rumors or restructure rumors, every, everyone. And that makes sense. Honestly. I mean, when you're in this situation and it's a rebuild, <laughs> if they can call whatever they want, it's, it's a rebuild. And it doesn't mean a rebuild doesn't mean it's a tear down start from the ground, but you tear it down to the, the studs and then you rebuild. Right. So I, I think that's what we're seeing here. What do you think they get back for Zach Ertz? It's a great question. I'm going to say, they, I'm going to say a four. I think they get a four. It could be a, a five that can become a four, but I'm just going to say a, f- a four. That's where I am. I think a conditional five. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I think they'll have multiple offers. One will be for a conditional five that becomes a four and another for four. And they will take the four. I have a, so that's where I am, but I think it'll end up being a four either way. Um, which, you know, yeah. I think a four for him. That's great. I mean, because there's not – everyone in the world knows they're trying to trade him. It's pretty clear he's not coming back here. So you're getting something for a guy that you'd probably cut otherwise. And if I'm a team out there looking for a tight end, heck, I'll, I'll take Jack Ertz for a four. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I mean, yeah and his, his contract is manageable. It's not like it's, it's crazy. I mean, they'd probably rework it, but his base salary for this year is not outrageous if he – gets close to the level of production he once had. Right. Right. No, the, the issue wasn't his, this salary it was the next out, the next contract mm-hmm. here. So that's a whole separate issue. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's the, the contract doesn't make him untradeable. Yeah, I agree. Uh, an interesting one. Uh, Sports Illustrated's Albert Breer reported that uh, Brandon Brooks name has uh surfaced in trade discussions and we don't know to what level those discussions have been so it could have been 
you know, someone asks about him. We, we have no idea, but that would be an interesting one because for, for a lot of reasons, there's some layers to this one. At his best, Brooks is one of the best guards in the league, but he's coming off the injury. He's 31. He has a, a high salary this year. Another layer is if they trade him before June 1st, they don't really save much cap space. They save like $2.3 million. So this wouldn't be like the earth you can look at as like a salary dump trade. That wouldn't be this. I mean, they'd have to get something significant back if they're going to trade Brandon Brooks. And again, I'm not sure as great as he is. I mean, he's, you know, he hasn't finished what the last three seasons um, and he's, 31, I think be 32 in August, I think. Um, I'll have to check that. But uh, I'm not sure he'd have great value on the open market. Um, if he was a post June 1, I think there'd be a lot more savings, but then you get killed in 2022. Um, I think there'd it's be. It's not too bad in 22. It's, you know, it's, but it's, it's, you know, you can't keep kicking everything down, you know, um, down a year, but. Um, it's interesting to me because if you are committed to Jalen Hurts, don't you want to put the best possible O line in front of him uh, to, to, you know, do your want- way? If you're committed to Jalen Hurts or not, you're gonna have a young quarterback. True, right? Um, you know, it's it's one thing to go, you know, to to rebuild and, and move on from older guys that aren't uh, producing, but you know, and and it could be the injury thing. You know, maybe they think. Um, you know, he's, he's another guy that's always hurt. And, um, so I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't really look at him that way, but I mean that, you know, he hasn't finished the season since the Super Bowl season. So that is there and older guys with lower leg, you know, with, with leg weight bearing type injuries. Um, it's, it's a, it's a red flag. Um, so that could be it. Maybe they love Sua. I uh, just, I, I don't know. I don't expect him to be traded. I, I'd be surprised if that happens. Um, yeah, I would be too. I mean, I, I'd try to restructure him. Maybe there's some hesitance from either side about a restructure and that's what led to, and, and I don't know this, but that could possibly lead to trade discussions. If either right. he didn't want to restructure or the team isn't ready to commit more because a lot of these restructures, you have to kind of commit a little bit more to the guy in order to do it. Maybe they don't want to do that. That's, that's possible. Um, but in a way, as much as I love Brandon, and I mean, you're closer to him than I am, but I mean, he's one of my favorite guys. I mean, I just think the world of him. And the same goes for Ertz. If, if you, I, I like the fact that they're exploring everything. I think they're at the point where they have to. Um, there can't be any sacred cows at this point. You've got you know, you've got to look at every possibility to, to, to save money, to save cap space, uh, and to get draft picks and, you know, and then, and then you worry about <laughs> trying to nail those draft picks, but you, you have to do that. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to go into a youth movement, you have to be fully committed and you, you have to, um, you have to rethink the whole way that you're, you're building your roster. And, and it looks like that's what they're doing. Yeah. I, I do want to, we mentioned it on the last pod about Kelsey, but my point about the offensive line, if there's one position where you don't go full young and you, you put resources into it this year, it's the offensive line because you, you saw what happened last year when you don't have an O-line, they didn't have a chance. It, I mean, that as much as anything wrecked the team last year, not having a, a solid O-line that they could rely on. And I know there are question marks about Brooks being healthy. I know there are question marks about Lane Johnson being healthy, but if those two guys are healthy, there's a good line. And you're really then giving yourselves a chance to figure out if Hertz is your guy, because he's going to be protected if those guys play to their normal level. So uh, more than any other position on the team, O-line is where I'd be the most hesitant to just go all out. You've moved. Yeah, and I think they've kind of, I mean, at least Kelsey move and they restructured Lane and Lane's 30. Um, I mean, Lane's only a year younger, I think, than Brooks, right? A year younger. Um, obviously, they moved on from, you know, Jason Peters. But that was an extreme case. And he wasn't We playing. don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. That's true. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And I think they seem to be looking at that 
looking at it that way. You know, they, I think they're, I mean, I still expect the, the, you know, the right side of the O-line to be Kelsey and, and, and uh, Brandon Lane. So, you know, we'll see if, if they really do move Brandon Brooks, um, unless they get, you know, terrific compensation, which I, I don't see. I mean, what do you think you get for Brandon Brooks? And again, it, it doesn't have to do with how good a player is. You have to look at, at their, I mean, people don't trade premium draft picks for guys in their thirties. It just doesn't happen. And he's coming off an Achilles. Like I, I know he's a cyborg, but we haven't seen him play yet. You know, we, we a team would have to feel comfortable enough that his recovery is going well. I mean, obviously, we think it is. He, he's he's running again, and um, heck, he was able to practice by the end of last year a little bit. Yeah. Um, but we don't know. No one really knows until he's in a real football practice again. Right. Yeah. So I just don't see that. I mean, you're not going to get a second round pick for for Brandon Brooks, and, and unless you do. I don't think there's a reason to trade him. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, I wanted to, before we finish up this podcast, I wanted to go over uh, an interesting mock draft from our buddy Mike Mulhern, who's the Eagles pre- and post-game producer. Uh, it's our first mock draft this year with the Eagles trading down. Uh, so I wanted to get your take on this. It's certainly interesting. So I'll just go through his his first round here real quick up to the number six pick. He has Trevor Lawrence at one, no surprise there. Zach Wilson at two to the Jets. Jamar Chase at three to the Dolphins. Justin Fields at four to Ohio State. Um, Sewell at five to the Bengals. And then at six, he actually has... Fields to Ohio State? Oh, I say that. Justin Fields to Atlanta. Um, (laughs) And then at six, he has... You just had to correct me there. At six, he actually has the Eagles trading. What? I never get a chance to correct you. I know. Uh, at six, he has the Eagles trading down to number 12 with San Francisco, who would then in turn give up their 2022 first round pick <laughs> to the Eagles. And San Francisco takes Trey Lance and then several picks down the board at number 12. He has the Eagles taking Jalen Waddle out of Alabama. Yeah, it's an interesting um, approach. Um, you get picks back. You still get, uh, I think, a really, really good receiver who, I mean, Waddle might be as good as those other two guys. I just, I mean, we don't know, but I think he's going to be really terrific. You get the picks. I mean, if he didn't get hurt this year, he we could be talking about him instead of Devontae Smith. I think there's I think there's a good chance of that. Um, I, I like getting the picks back. Um, you know, if – if you've decided, especially, and I, I think he did this before, before the news came out about that Jalen's their quarterback. So yeah, mm-hmm. if, if you're going by that, then this really it makes a lot of sense. Um, Trey, <laughs> Trey Lance to the Niners with the Eagles pick is is uh, ironic and funny, and that's 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 pretty high for him. Uh, you know, I don't six. think that's a reach, though. I don't think that's a reach. I don't know. There's, I mean, I think he's one of those possible low, you know, low floor, high ceiling guys. I just don't know. Played so little. Um, he's got Kyle Pitts going to the Giants at 11. Uh, you know, it would, uh, I mean, he's, I, I just, I would love to see Jalen Hurst throwing to Kyle Pitts, but you know, I, I, I like what he did here. Um, I think there's, um, it, it certainly makes a lot of sense. And, yeah. you, get, and you get the picks. That's the thing. And the way this and uh, the way I think the draft is going to go is quarterbacks go early. They always do. You know, we, we sit here and talk about it in March. And then, you know, in April, the quarterbacks are rising, they're not rising, but teams want quarterbacks and they're going to move up to get them. So if the Eagles have really made a decision that Jalen Hurts is a the guy, they're going to be watching quarterbacks come off at one. Even if the Jets don't draft a quarterback. I still think a quarterback is going to two. Yeah, uh, I think that's probably true. Um, yeah, it's always it's always funny how people talk about this guy's dropping, this guy's rising. That that's not what's happening. It just means that that teams have evaluated guys differently than than yeah. mock drafts. Basically, is is what it means. Yeah, I. That, but it's, quarterbacks always go, you know. So I, 
I think we're going to see a quarterback at two. I think the Jets, if, if they decide they're going to s- stick it out with Sam Darnold, and I wouldn't, by the way, at this point, I would trap Zach Wilson. But if they that's what they decide, then they better trade that second pick. Someone's going to be willing to get up there and take it. I would sure. think. I think they're going to. I think they're going to stay at two and take and take a QB. Yeah, that's uh, what I would do. I would think so. I've seen enough of Sam Darnold to think that. Yeah, that they should go elsewhere. Yeah. So. Uh, but yeah, I, I like uh, I, I like the way Mike approached this, and I think it's a reasonable. Uh, I think it'd be great for the Eagles. Uh, you know, again, it's it's all about picks, man. How many picks can you get? And uh, go. And this would possibly give them three first round picks next year. Yeah, yeah. So their rookie wage scale would be a, a, a disaster, but um, they could really. And I mean, you're. You, you go into this saying, you know, you're not going to be good in, in 2021 20, anyway. So um, why not? You're basically trading assets this year for assets next year and getting a, an elite wide receiver at 12. So uh, it makes perfect sense to me. I like it. Yeah. The, but when the Eagles trade down, the way that they do it is generally like they'll say, we have four players, you know, that we kind of grade – evenly and like if there's not a player they love at six and they're getting a great offer like this they'd say all right we have four players right and we like these four players they're pretty similar we feel confident that if we go back six places based on what our scouts have figured out these other teams are going to do that we're going to get one of these four players that's when they do it right. um and that's just the way and i think it's a good way to look at the draft it doesn't always work out based on the way the eagles have drafted but it's all about value for howie when it comes to time in april and this would be a way to get some value back yeah i like the way mike thinks mike's mike mike's uh that's what makes mike a good producer he thinks out of the box yeah it's it was certainly interesting you got anything else before we wrap this up no no let's bring on uh let's bring on march 17th and get to get to work rebuilding this roster <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done if you enjoy eagle eye do us a favor please rate and subscribe wherever you get your pods if you're watching on youtube we appreciate you guys as well please click like and subscribe there for rube i'm dave we'll talk to you guys soon